All right, let's try that again, this time with feeling. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Carl Brown. I teach history here at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. I'm pleased to see so many of you here in the audience tonight. We also have a substantial audience uh, watching the live stream uh, from their hosts, so welcome to you remotely as well. Um, you've already been told to shut off your phones, so I can skip that part. Um, and I'll, try to keep my, I'll try and keep my remarks as brief as possible, but there are a number of people that I have to thank who helped us put all this together. Um, first off, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the Tommy Thompson Center for sponsoring this event and their all-star team of Alex Talk, Ruth Brash, and Mary-Kate Antoneda for working on it. Ruth Brash is here tonight. Ruth, thank you so much again <laughs> for all your help. Um, <coughs> the Thompson Center was established to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thompson, who worked, across, who worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future public leaders, fostering leadership skills, and promoting effective public leadership. They work to further these goals by offering public events, funding research and scholarships, honoring exemplary public leaders with a Distinguished Public Leadership Award, and conducting other activities across all UW campuses. Uh, Thompson Center events are always free and open to the public, and I hope to keep an eye out for future TTC-sponsored events here and at other UW campuses. Um, okay, I'd also like to thank uh, Ethan Rosing, Sarah Hyden, and Heather Haywood of the Young Auditorium uh, for their help in putting together the, the tech side of this. Uh, Jeff Anglieri, Christine Zabayos, and Craig Sh Shrine, and Craig Schreiner of UW uh, Marketing and Communications for their help with uh, figuring out how to publicize it, and also my colleagues in the history department for their help, support, and tolerance of me sometimes letting things slide while I was working on this instead. I work with the best people in the world here. Um, also, uh, thanks also go out to the members of Phi Alpha Theta, the National History Honor Society, of which I am the faculty advisor. They have been instrumental in helping me put this uh, together, and honestly working with them is one of the better parts of my job here. It's just great to work with students who care about history, who want to work semester work. Thank you all for that. Um, and lastly, a special thanks goes out to uh, Karen McCulloch, the proprietor of The Book Teller, our local bookstore. Uh, Karen and I put, yeah, yeah. So Karen and I plotted this event uh, starting back in the spring, and together we put together a group of community members and members of Phi Alpha Theta to meet as a book group, uh, or as a book club, twice this last month. Um, so we, we, we um, got about a dozen folks together, sat around and spoke with the devil, and then our <laughs> last line, Okay, and then the questions we have for Mr. Larson tonight are based on that conversation between the college students and community members. Um, I think this is a really great way to go about kind of bridging that town and down divide. I do think it's like a, a real manifestation of, of the Wisconsin idea where the UW system is here for the entire community, not just students, not just faculty, right? Um, okay, full stop, deep breath, carriage return. With that out of the way, I'd now like to introduce my co-host, Faith Long. Faith was the 2021 recipient of the Phi Alpha Theta John T. Larimer Scholarship. She's the current vice president of Phi Alpha Theta a former representative on the Dean's Advisory Board. Uh, Faith studied abroad in Scotland last spring and she is currently writing her capstone thesis on, make sure I get this right, on shifting perceptions of infanticide in Scotland in the early modern period. I'm very pleased to have her as my partner in crime, or at least talking about crime on stage tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Faith Larson. Long, Faith Long. Yeah, I was like, oh, wrong one. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, so now what we're all here for. Eric Larson is a master narrative of nonfiction. His books have won several awards and been published worldwide. Eric Larson has written on topics ranging from the sinking of the Lusitania, the Galveston hurricane of 1900, the rise of Nazism in Germany, and most recently, The Splendid and the Vile, a saga of Churchill, family, and defiance during the Blitz, a biography of Winston Churchill's first year as prime minister. The Splendid and the Vile is a New York Times notable book of 2020 and a Kirkus best book of 2020. His audio only novel, No One Goes Alone, has been acquired by Chernin Entertainment in association with Netflix with plans to adapt it into a feature film. He is currently working on his next book to be released in spring of 2024. He remains best known for his The Devil in the White City which intertwines the story of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and H.H. H. Holmes, America's first serial killer. 
It remained on the New York Times bestseller list for a combined total of over six years, won an Edgar Award for nonfiction crime writing, was nominated for the National Book Award, and was voted one of the 125 most important books of the last 125 years by the New York Public Library. As it is the 130th anniversary of the events Larson so vividly describes in Devil in the White City, and 20 years since its publication of the book itself, we think it's a devil of a good time to ask Eric to revisit his book, his work more broadly, the nature of publishing today, and diverse other topics. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Eric Larson to UW-Whitewater. Sorry, I should clarify before we begin that uh, Faith and I have roughly half an hour to 40 minutes of questions, and then we're gonna open up to the audience for you to share, for you to ask uh, Mr. Larson your questions yourselves. I'll have two members of Phi Alpha Theta, Ashton and Kennedy. There's one, and well, okay. Um, when we're done with the questions, go over there to grab the mics, then you'll be passing those out to people in the audience as they raise their hands, okay? Thank you, sorry, Faith, take it away. All right, so first question, um, maybe an obvious one. What was your inspiration for this book? How did you first decide to tell the story this way, you know, intertwining the World's Fair and a serial killer? <coughs> Long story. <laughs> so if you're ready for this, I'll give you the origin story, not just of this book, but basically of, of, of my career. What happened was that in 1994, I read a book called The Alienist. How many of you have read that book? Right? It's a thriller set in old New York. Really good, really good. Caleb, Caleb, uh, Caleb, Caleb Cohen, yeah. And what I loved about that book was its evocation of old New York. It was a novel, it was fiction, but I loved the way it, it captured a sense of that past time. So I started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to try to write a book about a real live, <laughs> sort of a contradiction there, but a real live murder set back in you know, some period in the 19th century, let's say, and try to evoke that period in, in the same way, only have it be all factual. So I went to my library. I was living in Seattle at the time. I went to the Suzula Library at the University of Washington and took out a book called The, the Encyclopedia of Murder. You know, this, is, this is how it's done. I, I started, started reading at A. I don't know where I came across Holmes, the killer in Devon White City, either at H for, for his assumed name or Mudgett, his real name. I read about him, and I, I just was not that interested in writing about him. I didn't want to do crime porn. I mean, this is a guy with dissection tables, acid vats, and so forth. I wanted something more along the lines of that, that old film, Gosford Park, you know, something full of mood and atmosphere. So I kept looking for, for a, a murder, and I, again, I warned you this is a long story. I kept looking for a murder. Um, I found something that was kind of interesting, would, would occupy my time, but it just was not particularly mysterious. Pursued that until I came across a headline in the New York World, newspaper, newspaper in New York, um, that said, that talked about a, a gigantic hurricane. Yes, I know I'm talking about Isaac Storm first before getting to Devon White City. But it talked about a gigantic hurricane that destroyed Galveston, Texas. So I was really transfixed by that. Decided to do a book about that, did that, became Isaac Storm. Once again, I was interested in doing a crime story. Um, and I started looking again for, for a killer. Um, but it just felt like a, a fruitless pursuit. I just I wasn't getting anywhere. So one day, though, um, uh, I got to thinking, whenever I'd read about Holmes or Mudgett, um, I learned about, I heard about the World's Fair of 1893, which is something I didn't know anything about at the time. So I went back to the library, took out a couple of books about the World's Fair of 1893. And you know, it, by all counts, the first book that I read should have killed the book dead right then. This was a monographic history about one aspect of the World's Fair, and it was so boring. You know, <laughs> clearly, clearly somebody was trying to get tenure, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> <clears throat> but it was, <laughs> no offense to anybody, but, but it, was, it was so boring, I just, I could barely get through this thing. But I knew from experience that, that you, you really need to check out the footnotes, especially in books like this, because that's often where the writer puts the juice. You know, It can't go in the main body, but 
Stuff is so good, it's got to be in the footnotes. First footnote I came to said that juicy fruit gum was introduced at the World's Fair of 1893. Now, I was a huge fan, I am a huge fan of juicy fruit gum. Um, I'm sure a lot, show me, show me hands, how many of you like juicy fruit gum? Juicy fruit gum is one of those weird obsessions, right? It's this, it's this weird gum, you, you can't really describe the flavor, <laughs> right? But, you know, if you're riding on a bus and somebody next to you is chewing juicy fruit gum, they smell as if they had just thrown up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But I love juicy fruit gum, and I thought, wow, this is 100 years old. So I started reading more about more of the footnotes, learned about Cracker Jack, um, the, the, the zipper, things introduced at the fair. And suddenly I was like, wait, this is my story. This is my story. I mean, the thing was nicknamed the White City. This is a story about good and evil. I will write about Holmes. He's the bad guy, and I will write about the fair. That's the, 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 this, this consummate act of civic goodwill, the white city. And my title, I had my title within 24 hours, The Devil in the White City. That's how it started. Excellent, thank you. Um, There's more to that story. No. <laughs> <laughs> Other types of gum, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So uh, let me see, uh, other than both things happening in the same time at the same place, obviously, what do you think is the most important link between these two storylines? Most important link between the two storylines? You know, that's, that's part of the problem. There really isn't a link except for the fact that there is this juxtaposition of good and evil, which I think in and of itself is, is, is a powerful thing to think about. I mean, think, think about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This has been something that writers have been transfixed by throughout, throughout literary, literary history. The reality is, in Devil in the White City, the two stories really only touch in one very small, isolated place. I should tell you that on the eve of publication, I was absolutely convinced that my career was over, that, that this book was going to be slaughtered by the critics because of the parallel narratives that never actually touched. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. All right. Um, so some of us in the book group were more interested in the world's fairs. Others were more captivated by Holmes. We suspect you hear this often. Um, was one part of this story easier to tell than the other? Did one or the other interest you more? One was much easier to tell, and actually that was the story of the World's Fair itself. Once I got to the point in my thinking about the, the, the story, once I got to the point where I, I had to come up with a way of talking about the World's Fair, I didn't want to just talk about the fair, like, oh, here's this fair, isn't it interesting? Here's this exhibit, here's this exhibit. Too static. When I finally resolved that I was going to write about the creation of the World's Fair, suddenly the story really began to take shape. And I realized who the main characters were in that saga, one being Daniel Burnham, the director of the fair. Uh, an amazing guy, talk about, talk about leadership. This is a guy, you know, I mean, you have to put things in perspective. This is a guy who led an effort to create essentially an entire city in a year and a half, a year and a half. While I was doing the research for this book, we had our basement in Seattle renovated. That took six months. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm often asked, I'm often asked by people, so what made you decide to write about architecture and, 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 and a serial killer? And, and my response ever since then is, believe me, there are many parallels between architecture and serial murder, you know, <laughs> if, you've ever, if you've ever done an extensive renovation. <laughs> so, so, but here was Burnham, and he, he put this thing together. He led the effort that, that created this, this, this city with gigantic buildings in a year and a half. I was, I was enthralled by that. And I hoped that, I hoped, as I went along, I hoped that readers would be drawn to the book by the serial killer, but then would fall in love with the fair narrative and follow that through. I think that was achieved. <laughs> <laughs> Come for the murder, stay for the fair. <laughs> so, uh, let me see, okay, so the, um, I, I wanna come back to something you said earlier about sort of this, this juxtaposition of states or things. A number of people in the book group, uh, in the book group uh, commented on this sort of like the, the two-sided or dichotomous nature of this book. These two different things going on, right. seemingly opposites. But we got to we got to thinking and asking ourselves, two sides of which coin, right? Is this 
um, two sides of the Gilded Age of ingenuity and creativity, the human condition more broadly. What um, two sides of what are we talking about? Well, yeah, <coughs> two sides, two sides of the human condition. I think at, at, at the most fundamental level, but but also I think really, really it speaks to the Gilded Age, which is one of my favorite, probably my absolute favorite era to write about. I would love to find another another project. Um, the Gilded Age. The reason I love the Gilded Age is because that was a time in American history where we as Americans felt we could do absolutely anything we set our minds to, absolutely anything. Is that, that, that sense of boundless ambition is what colors for me that, that period. And both these characters, Holmes and Burnham, were heroic in very different ways. Holmes was heroic as a serial killer, I mean, a dark, dark hero, but you know, he, he had sort of perfected the art of serial, of serial murder. And Burnham was a hero in terms of, you know, embodying this this hubris of, of the age. So in that respect, they, yeah, both sides of, of, of the Gilded Age. All right. Um, so another thing we kind of commented on quite a bit in book club is this idea of women at the turn of the century and the World's Fair and kind of Chicago more broadly um, promising an escape from small town life um, some sense of agency and autonomy in this vibrant public space, um, but some of them end up victims of homes and other predators. Can you say a bit about how you approached telling their stories? Well, <coughs> so one, one of the things that I found intriguing was that, was that this was possibly the first time in American history where a young woman could leave the farm on her own and go to the big city and the big city being Chicago, it was very easy to disappear. It was very easy to disappear. The Chicago Tribune was full of news stories about people who just, you know, disappeared. Uh, they weren't all killed by, killed by homes that would really make the body count rise. But, but you know, you, you, one thing I loved was Chicago in that era. For example, you know, uh, passenger trains and freight trains running through the city at, at grade level. You know, I mean, think about this. Trains screaming through Chicago, people walking around, people were routinely killed by trains rocketing through Chicago. It's just such a, such a vibrant, but also in a mechanical and an emotional sense, violent age. It was just very, very compelling. I'm wandering there. Rein me in. <laughs> uh, women, um, women, okay. Women. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so, so I was, I, I, you know, I found that a really compelling aspect that, that, that women coming into the city were particularly vulnerable. And I think that that's what Holmes was, was praying about, so. Gotcha. Now, um, uh, I'd like to ask a question about historiography for non-historians in the audience. That's the practice mm -hmm. of actually writing history. Um, how, how we go about going from the evidence to the narrative, right? That's that'd be the analysis. And, um, uh, the, you're, uh, you're famous, I think rightfully so, for being very rigorous and meticulous about how you find your sources and how to use them. But I think in this book, one of the more striking things for, for historians is how you go about um, explaining Holmes's, um, uh, how you speculate on his motives, intentions, and decision-making process. Right. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm wondering how we, well, well, first off, what's it like trying to get inside the mind of a serial killer? But um, uh, secondly... I thought it was kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know. Uh -oh. <laughs> but, but more broadly, how do we go <laughs> from the text available, that is, I think, his autobiography, how do we get from that to the parts of your narrative where you tell his story? Right, right. Yeah, Ho Holmes was, a, was, a, was the most difficult element of, of the story. The World's Fair part, um, so heavily documented with Burnham's files at the Art Institute and so forth. No... No particular challenges there except making the story not be boring. You know, I mean, building a World's Fair can in and of itself be, be fairly, fairly tedious unless you tease out the better, better elements. Holmes was a problem because while there is actually quite a bit of evidence, there's, he, there is his autobiography, the Chicago Daily Tribune, after his crimes were discovered, had incredible coverage for 
two weeks afterwards, full pages in, in the Chicago Daily Tribune, excerpting or presenting entire letters from families of the missing people and so forth. But one element escaped me, um, and that was the moment of, of murder, the moment of murder. And there is a scene, I can't remember which victim he, he, he's killing at this point, but I really felt I owed it to the reader to provide some sense of how this killing came to be based on the available evidence. Um, I wouldn't say speculation, I would say rather deduction based on what was available. Um, and then in my footnotes, and I'm sure you found this, I explained the architecture of that scene and how it came together. Um, I don't know that I would do that now, you know, but, but it seemed very important at the time to, to capture a sense of how he went about it. There are, by the way, there are, by the way, 850 footnotes in that, in that, uh, in that book. I counted them. Goodness. Um, well, and now kind of shifting from, you know, Devil in the White City specific uh, content questions and kind of just more to publishing and your career in general. Can, can, I, can I just pause one moment on Devil in the White City? Historiography. One of my all-time favorite things, one of the things I love and loved most about that book and the research for that book was all the scrupulous detail that the participants in the fair, um, uh, all the efforts that they took to record right down to the number of bolts in the, in, the, in, the, in the Ferris wheel. And this stuff is so important to me. If you'll indulge me, I was going to, I happened to bring something to read. Um, can, may I? I, I, think, I think I have it with me. All right, so, so it's probably my most favorite passage in the entire book. You'll think less of me when you hear it. Uh, this, is, this is about the World's Fair. Once it, once it was getting underway, it started to look like this thing was actually going to be a success. Not at all clear until a certain point during the fair. Visitors wore their best clothes as if going to church and were surprisingly well behaved. In the six months of the fair, the Colombian Guard made only 2,929 arrests, about 16 per day, typically for disorderly conduct, petty theft, and pickpocketing, with pickpockets most favoring the fair's always crowded aquarium. The guard identified 135 ex-convicts and removed them from the grounds. It issued 30 fines for carrying Kodaks. I mentioned that to you earlier. Kodaks without a permit. 37 for taking unauthor unauthorized photographs. Burnham, Burnham did not want people randomly taking candid photographs. I, somebody presented me actually with a, with a scrapbook full of actual candid photographs taken during the fair. No wonder he didn't want it. The grounds were covered with litter. It was amazing. So the, the guard investigated the discovery on the grounds of three fetuses, a Pinkerton detective, quote, assaulting visitors, end quote, at the Tiffany Pavilion, and, quote, a Zulu acting improperly, end quote. With so many people packed among steam engines, giant rotating wheels, horse-drawn fire trucks, and rocketing bobsleds, the fair's ambulances superintended by a doctor named Gentles. If, if I spent an entire day in an archive and I learned that the guy who invented this, this, this new, new innovative ambulance service that, that had, had rubber tires so it wasn't so painful, if I learned that that guy's name was Dr. Gentles, I'd go home very happy. A, a doctor named Gentles would constantly delivering bruised, bloody, and overheated visitors to the exposition hospital. Over the life of the fair, the hospital treated 11,602 patients, 64 a day for injuries and ailments that suggest that the mundane sufferings of people have not changed very much over the ages. The list included, and I warn you, I often learn things from audiences when I, I read this list. The list included 820 cases of diarrhea, 154 constipation, 21 hemorrhoids. That, don't we think that's got to be low? I mean, <laughs> I mean, look, shredded wheat was invented, was, it, was brought, introduced to the consumers at the World's Fair. Anyway, 434 cases of indigestion, 365 foreign bodies in the eyes, 364 severe headaches, 594 episodes of fainting, syncope, and exhaustion, and my single most favorite fact in the entire book, one case of extreme 
flatulence. <laughs> now this is where this is where history, you know, there are, there are things that you are just dying to know. Like we can be fairly certain this is a guy. But the question is, who rode with him? <laughs> anyway, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> that was, oh, that was great. Um, I actually want to ask... Uh, Sorry. Uh, no, that, that was great. That was great. Um, I want to ask a follow-up question about photography, right? Because this is, I mean, the Kodak it first starts marketing their camera in, what, the 1880s, 83, I think? Right, so this is relatively recent after that. And the whole promise of it was that, you know, people could go and document their lives. So it's surprising that they managed to ban photographs at the fair. That's like a, a very, like, almo almost, I would say, a very modern sense of um, intellectual property, you know, hoarding yeah, or something. Or, or a modern, modern, surprisingly modern sense of, of, of wanting to control how something was perceived. And that's very interesting that Burnham, of all people, would be so tuned to that. I mean, I, it, it, it makes perfect sense once you get a sense of him. But yeah, I mean, I, I found that one of the more charming aspects of the whole thing, that you had to, you had to get a permit to use this, this, this camera that was designed to be something you could bring anywhere. Uh, how weird was that? All right. Um, so it's been 20 years since Devil in the White City was published. How has the publishing industry changed in the meantime, and has it been for better or for worse? How has the publishing industry changed in that period? So, so you, 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 yeah, well, I, it's, it, it's hard for me to address because, because I, really, I really make it a point to just keep my head down and do my books and not think about the business of publishing. I don't need the heartbreak. You know, I, I, I really try not to, not to think about it. My agent keeps wanting to tell me sales numbers for my books. And I'm like, David, how many times do I have to tell you? I don't want to know. My job is to write these books. I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to be thinking about something else than the, than the narrative at hand. So in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask about changes in the publishing industry. But obviously, things that have com come to pass since Devil in the White City, um, audio books, um, um, Kindles, and so forth, which I think is just an amazing revolution. I mean, I don't care how you read my books. I read, you know, whether it's you, you read by listening or you read on a Kindle, as long as, as, long as you do it. Um, and, and that's been a revolution. And that has freed, freed writers to do some very interesting things. I mean, it freed me to do my, my audio-only ghost story. No one goes alone. And, and you know, I, I don't think I ever would have tried to do that if there wasn't this unique sort of niche area where I could do this story and I didn't have to worry about confusing readers by having a, a fictional ghost story on the same shelf as my narrative books. So it has presented many, many opportunities. Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Um, you don't have to answer that. No, no, th I mean, it, it's a good question, I think, because, I mean, well, I know in academe, uh, th as a rule, you have to publish that book, I mean, to, to, to advance, and when fewer books are being published and fewer people reading them, that's a real, you know, that, that, that threatens um, my livelihood yeah, and job yeah. in some senses, right? Um, can, can you get tenure with an audio book? I haven't tried. Um, <laughs> so I already have sorry. 10 years. <laughs> I'm just trying to think how to answer that tactfully. But um, no, that, um, <laughs> I'm not planning on leaving, so thank you. Um, <laughs> that was too senseless. Um, I wanted to come, I, I want to actually follow up with uh, what you just mentioned. Your uh, most recent work is an audio only ghost story and fiction. So with the, you've published what, a, a dozen books of nonfiction, and it seems like you're just going right off in the other direction with this. Can you tell us more about that well, and your inspiration so, for so it? So actually, actually the, 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 I, uh, personally, I think the, 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 the move to do that makes a lot of sense, and I'll explain why. When I was working on my book, Thunderstruck, about, Mar <coughs> excuse me, about Marconi and England's second most famous killer, Holly Harvey Crippen, um, I collected a lot of material about the late 19th century obsession with the occult. 
you know, real stuff. Like, you know, William James, the pioneering psychologist at Harvard, was really into the spiritual, studying, studying spiritual mediums and so forth. There was the, the Society for, for Psychical Research, which drew many of the, the, the brightest, most scientific minds of the era, physicists. Um, famous writers and so forth, all, all sort of, it even had a committee, a committee on haunted houses, that's what it was called, a committee on haunted houses. They did 400 investigations of haunted houses, never found a single house that was actually haunted. And I got to thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to put some of these characters in motion? William James, who I, I adore. If I could do a book about William James at some point, I, 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 I will. Um, uh, get William James in the story, a character, Josiah Frost, who represented the, the emerging technocrat. He was a quote-unquote electrician, but that meant he was an electrical engineer in that period. Get these people all together and put them in motion in a ghost story that happens to be a real ghost story. If that sort of makes sense. And so that's, that's how that came about. And to me, it was a great way to use all this excess stuff that I collected. And I wrote it during a book tour. So it was just an ideal use of my time. Gotcha, thank you. Um, now let me ask, uh, you graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, summa cum laude in Russian uh, history, society, and culture. And you also have a master's degree in journalism uh, from Columbia. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering uh, which elements of your formal training as a historian and a journalist have been most useful to you in your writing career? On the other hand, are there any things that you learned that you found you had to unlearn? forget. You know, you know <coughs> I, I can answer that in a very specific way. When, after, for, first of all, <laughs> I should explain why, why I went to journalism school. I was working in New York in publishing. I had resolved that, uh, that I was going to, whatever I did for a living was going to involve writing in some way because I wanted to make a living writing. I don't want to sit in a garret somewhere and write for myself. I wanted to write and get paid for it in the Hemingway tradition. So I was working for a, for a publisher, Grassen and Dunlap in New York. And, and one day, um, with friends, I went to see all the presidents met. I'm sure many of you have seen that film. I loved that film. I loved the suspense. And of course, you know, Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman, and what's not to like, right? And, and I figured, okay, th so that's journalism. I, I could get into that. So I decided I'm going to apply to 1J school. And that was Columbia, because that's where I really, really wanted to go and let fate take a hand. If the fate smiled and I got in, there I go. Otherwise, I was going to go to Europe with my girlfriend, as one did. Um, I got in, I got in. Um, I tried to go to Europe anyway with my girlfriend. We broke up two weeks into the trip. Um, and, and I went to graduate school of journalism and, and, and absolutely loved what I was doing. But the thing that really influenced what I do now, I believe, was my tenure at the Wall Street Journal. Because when I was at the Wall Street Journal, we had the luxury of spending a long time working on, working on stories. And it really honed my sense of, of detail, how to collect detail, how to mine detail. And that's what I, that's what I do now. I often think of my books as, you know, the, 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 the central narrative is like a Christmas tree. That's the central narrative. And then the fun part is, is putting the ornaments on that tree, you know, being mindful not to put so many ornaments on it that it falls over, you know, in front of the Times Reviewer. Um, so th that's been a very, very direct tie between my journalism career. Gotcha. And then let me, let me just revisit the, uh, the second part of that. Are there things that you learned in your formal training that you found are better left uh, that you just no longer do or have deliberately... Th things I learned, what? Oh, yeah, sorry, so in terms of the things, that the way you've been trained as a historian right. and journalist, right. are there elements of that training that you um, have had to unlearn or just forgotten about? You know, I didn't really have to unlearn anything. Um, I mean, it's just the, the nature of the two, two things. They're very, very different. What I, what I will say is that, that I, I so much prefer working with dead people. Uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, I mean, yeah, the journalism, I was, I mean, I, I was good at it, but I hated cold calling people, you know, calling people to, to you know, 
I still remember one day I was calling some guy, got his answering machine. I said, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about your indictment today in federal court on 35 counts of blah, 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 and then click, hang up. Um, uh, so I, I, I got to the point where I could not call another living person. Um, so. Um, so, on a little bit of a different note, I was wondering about the impact social media has had on your work. Um, social media kind of gets a bad rap as a rule, but perhaps counterintuitively, some social media has actually been encouraging people to read more. Right. Um, for example, research on the TikTok subcommunity Book Talk has found that 48% of TikTok users read more books than before Book Talk, and 62% of TikTok users have read at least one book based on a recommendation from Book Talk. What can you tell us about how social media has affected your career, and how do you think this will change going forward? So, I find that statistic very interesting and, 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 and very encouraging. Now, I can tell you what, what I do with social media. I, I have a website, which unfortunately I, I routinely neglect until my publicist reminds me. But, you know, it's a good way to reach out to people and show them, give them a sense of, of who, you, who you are beyond, beyond the book. I have, like, on my website, I have a, a biography, standard autobiography, but then I also have my alternative autobiography, which is probably the more accurate account of, of, of my life. But, you know, I find, I find Twitter, X, I find Twitter um, actually very helpful um, for keeping in touch with my readers. I have not had the negative experience that, that people have often talked about with Twitter. I find that my interactions on Twitter are almost uniformly pleasant and, and mutually, mutually sustaining and affirming. I, I find it very much that way. And it is a fantastic place to announce a new project. I don't chill on my, on my Twitter account. I don't say, oh, why don't you check out my book again, or this or that. But I do, once every whatever years, I will announce a new book. And it's very effective, it's very effective. So in that respect, I, I, I like it. I don't do TikTok, I, I don't do Facebook, I don't do Instagram, I should. You know, my kids are all on my case for not doing it. But but I do, I do Twitter. I wish to hell that Musk had not bought it and turned it into X. You know, um, that gloomy X appearing on my on my feed every day. Um, no, I miss the bird. <laughs> I miss the bird too. I mean, look, Twitter, Twitter, the the name Twitter, the bird. It was brilliant. It was brilliantly conceived. They're talking about branding, and then to just blow it away. Anyway. Elon and I are like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on kind of a related note, so y using social media to you know, kind of announce new projects, um, what can you tell us here about your next project? Nothing. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, I have a new project coming up. But I'm, I'm in a, uh, it's coming out April 30th, but I'm in a bizarre uh, position where I'm under orders from my publicist not to talk about the book um, until a, a certain later point. Well, you At can the tell same us, time. this is a pretty private uh, <laughs> yeah. context right here. I, I, none of us are going to tell, right? Well, at the same time, uh, at the same time, we had to announce the book in order for me to take part in a couple of, of big, big book things. So, so it's out there. I will tell you the title. I will not tell you the subtitle. The title is The Demon of Unrest. A lot of relevance to today, but it's from the past. Got it, thank you. Um, we're gonna wrap up with just one more question. So if Asher and Kennedy, can you go to the mics and we're uh, open it up for uh, questions from the audience uh, from this point on. But Eric, my last question for you is, um, what is your favorite book and why? My favorite book <clears throat> is The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. <laughs> I love that book. I just love it for the, we have to remember that, that when he wrote that book, those characters were brand new. You know, they were new on the stage of literary figures. And what a cast of characters. You know, Joel, Joel Cairo, Casper Gutman, Hammond himself, and of course, Richard O'Shaughnessy, you know, all these characters. But what I really loved is the way Hammond wrote that book. 
It's, it's really a, a narrative approach that is rarely tried and rarely done successfully, but he succeeded. You know, it, it's, I, I'm not even sure what the literary term for it is. Maybe somebody out there knows, but, but it's just very, very re removed, but you know exactly what's happening without him telling you. You know, it's a, I think it's a great book. And the film, the film is almost as good as the book, and in some ways better because those characters were brilliantly captured, I felt, by the directors of the, the film. The first, the first, and I think the only film. So. Well, good, well, thank you. Um, if we could bring the lights up a bit, and if we could have uh, some people pass the mics around for questions from the audience. Be a single thing that's going on. Um, uh, okay, so uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and somebody with a mic will come and find you. right and how does it compare to the devil in the white city <laughs> you know it's, it's it's hard to say what my most enjoyable book was because they all have unique challenges um, and they all have unique satisfactions but probably the one that was the most fun to work on was um, my book uh, thunderstruck the one about marconi and and holly harvey crippen fun because um, uh, I, I had, did a lot of travel. Um, you know, I, I could say all over the world, but it didn't include Asia, but travel from, travel to London, to Italy, to Nova Scotia. And for the, a, a chunk of travel in, in Italy, I was traveling with my, my daughter, who, who even at the age of uh, 16 spoke fluent Italian. She's one of those people with a, a gift. We had studied Italian together, and I had lost all mine within you know, a day. And she you know, somehow managed to retain a, a fluency. So, so we went off to, my <laughs> I take all my kids on, on research projects, so, so it's not like I was favoring one kid, although my other daughters still hold this trip against me. But so I took her to, took her to, to, to Rome with me. We had booked all this stuff. It was great, you know, um, I, I booked hotels in the old part of Rome. We had non-refundable air force and everything, we were ready to, re ready to go. And the Pope died. And we were convinced that everything was gonna be canceled, that the whole, the whole trip was gonna be a complete disaster. But it turned out to be one of the most interesting trips. We, we, we go to Rome, we're gonna visit with Marconi's granddaughter, who's a princess. We go to Rome. Um, and I, I assigned my daughter the task of, of talking to the, the charming uh, doorman at the hotel to find out the best restaurant to go for dinner. And so he, he, he told her this restaurant, and, and we're pretty sure he knew what was going to happen at this restaurant. How he would know, I don't know. So we go to this restaurant called Das Sabatino in the old city in Rome. We're sitting there outside. We're the only, the only people there aside from four priests who are drinking comped whiskey. And so, but we're sitting there. We finished dinner, and, and the waiter was quite charmed by, by my daughter. Um, he knew she was into the, the TV series Alias. He'd asked her about it. And so we're coming to the end of our meal, and he says, you know, we may want to get dessert. Well, okay, so we, we order dessert, right? We're into this dessert, and suddenly, this caravan of Italian police cars, these, these low-slung Alfa Romeos, come screaming into the piazza with these young, handsome cops leaning out of the windows, literally with guns drawn, pointing at the rooftops. This thing screams into the piazza in front of the, front of the restaurant. Between all these cars is a giant black Chevy Suburban. You have to wonder how that thing got into the old city of Rome. My feeling is it was probably lowered by helicopter and then driven 100 yards so for effect. So this, this caravan of cars pulls up, door of the suburban opens, and who steps out of that car but William Jefferson Clinton? Shockwave of charisma blasted from that suburban. You know, and he, he's... He, he, sw he swaggers up, he swaggers up the, the little corridor between the outdoor tables, swaggers up, says, who's he looking at? He's looking at me, 
No. Is he looking at my daughter? Yes. <laughs> Comes walk, waltzing up the, 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 the center aisle, looks down at my daughter and goes, well, hi. <laughs> and she's like, hi. The Secret Service guys were all covering their guns because they knew I was going to kill them. <laughs> I was going to kill them. But for that, for, that, for that very brief time, I was the equivalent in my daughter's eyes of Johnny Depp. You know, I had arranged this trip. So anyway, I, di I diverged. You're getting a sense of how I diverge in my books, right? I just can't help myself. <laughs> Somebody else had a question? Question? The focus tonight has been Devil in the White City. I just finished your In the Garden of the Beast. I just want to give a quick plug for that. I think it's a terrific book. Thank you. It's about the 1930s, the rise of Nazism. But it, it was published, I believe, in 2011. And it all seems so relevant <laughs> in a scary way today. And I wonder if you've given any thought to that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the thing that I was struck by with that book um, after, I'd, after I'd finished it was how quickly that transformation of German society and politics occurred. Um, and and that's, that's the warning, if there is one, in, in the Garden of Beasts, and how, how easy it was to look away and pretend it's not happening, and also how, 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 the, the, how German, leaders, German leaders thought, oh, we can control him, we can control Hitler. This isn't going to be a problem. And then, of course, we all realized they could not, in fact, control him. But thanks for the plug. You want to just shout your question? Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of faith in the reading public, and maybe I'm maybe I'm delusional, but I have a feeling that that, that readers will know when AI wrote a book, um, and and if nothing else, it will become apparent in the sex scenes. <laughs> it's just a hunch. It's just a hunch. <laughs> It's a good question. I, I, I don't know what's happening with AI. I, again, I, I, it's scary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other questions? Um, yeah. Oh. Sorry. So I uh, read Devil in the White City when I was in grad school for city planning. So came to it, obviously, for Burnham and Olmstead in the a uh, story of literal placemaking of a community of an actual city. Um, but in the book group that I was at on Monday, and thank you again, Carl and Karen, for putting that together, one of the things we were talking about was the kind of construction of a purpose or with a purpose of that placemaking, but also the construction with a purpose that you saw with homes across the street in the hotel. Um, we talked before about the kind of dichotomy of that, but I was wondering if that was something that you reflected on as you were writing it as well. Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, I, I think I was sort of getting at that a little bit when I talked about Holmes and Burnham being heroic in their own, in, 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 their, in their own ways. Um, in terms of deliberate placemaking, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's what it was. And what was particularly interesting about Burnham um, was that there was this this effort, this effort to make Chicago look really good through this thing, you know, um, and and his choice of the most grandiose architectural styles was, uh, to me, very, very interesting. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that very much uh, uh, on my radar when I was working on the book. <coughs> how about how about that gentleman right there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this. This, you know, obviously during the during the our, our interview, um, it, it was difficult. But as I said, there is actually a, a, a surprising amount of material available and and good material. There are some newspapers I wouldn't trust for a second. But then there were newspapers that I I did and do trust, and one of those was the coverage of the Chicago Daily Tribune. Particular kinds of coverage, though. Um, they would, as I said, they would publish letters, for example, from families concerned about their, their missing daughters. Letters um, uh, from the parent of one of the victims. You know, concrete stuff that filled endlessly these columns, which if you mine it carefully, there's, there's quite a bit of material. Also, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, there was his autobiography, which is very telling, um, uh, but also suspect, you know. Um, and then there, there, there were um, some uh, significant court documents in Philadelphia that are very helpful. The Philadelphia Inter-Ocean newspaper, another newspaper that was actually very good, I felt, very, very accurate. But in, in some, I think that there, there is actually I think there is is a surprise. You'd be surprised how much material is available. You know, I have a I have a big plastic bin just on them, the stuff I collected about about Holmes. But again, the 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 murder scene, speculating how that actually happened, I felt I had to do that. That was that was important. But I explained it in my footnotes exactly what the architecture of that scene was. Um, first thing I want to whoa. First thing I want to say is uh, it's just a huge honor to have you here, especially in Whitewater. So I appreciate that you've taken time to be here today. So first, I just want to say thank you for that. Thanks, um, thanks, son. <laughs> appreciate it. Um, I just want to. I'm sat here with my. A lot of people I'm sat with right now are from a creative writing class, and our professors here as well. Yeah. And I think the one thing as an aspiring writer is: is there any advice or any tips you would give to help future writers in the future? Well, you know, my, the, the advice I could give to any, any writer, um, um, I, I'm not sure if you mean the, in the process of trying to get published or, or find ideas or whatever, but the fundamental thing well, that I advise any writer is just, you, you got to be there to do it. You know, you got to set yourself a schedule, sit down and start at the same time every day, and I advise seven days a week because inspiration Inspiration will, you'll, ne you, you'll never, if you wait for inspiration, you will wait for a very long time. Inspiration is not, is not a phenomenon that you can attract by bird seed on the window, you know. Um, uh, as, I, as I often like to, the few times that I, I teach writing, one point that I try to make is if you, if you are trying to catch a bus, it helps to be at the bus stop, you know. And so just be there. You don't have to be there all day at your desk, but you got to be there for a chunk of time seven days a week. Larry McMurtry, only, I went to a talk of his once, and he, he claimed, and I have no reason to doubt, he claimed that he had only written an hour and a half each day to produce his books, but he did it every single day. Writing is, is sort of like erosion, you know, and, and that's the single best advice I think I can give to anybody. Just do it. Just keep doing it. Keep your head down. Get your stuff out there. And, and once you've got something out there circulating, start the next project because it's the work that, that, that will, will, will ultimately prevail. Pleasure. American Idol. Let's do it. OK, uh, th this gentleman first, then you.
<laughs> I thought about no. When I, when I think about my archive, it's a very good question, though, very good question. I, I know I, I have a number of writer friends who, who actually um, uh, put great stock in what their archives are going to be worth one day, right? Um, all I think about when I think about my archives is the amount of effort it would take just to get it into enough shape that somebody like you would be able to take a look at it, you know? So that, that's, what, that's as far as I get with the archives. Do I have to feed them? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I will. I will keep that. I will. I will. I will. Perseverate over that all night tonight. Yes, you. It's so, sort of a, a hybrid. Um, what I found was, I would write one part part of the story, until I actually started to get bored. I got tired of writing about a, a, a one aspect of the thing. Like I get tired of Holmes. Holmes, in the end, is a repulsive character. I find, and I got, I got, he, he made me sort of. I didn't. I don't like him. I don't like the way he, he thinks. He's creepy, um, which is good. It's good for for the for the book. So I would get to a certain point, stop writing, and then I go to the fair, right to a certain point, stop writing. We're back and forth like that. The key element of Devil in the White City, I remember it vividly, was when I, I had basically both rough drafts, right? And it came time to put the story together. And I laid everything out on my bedroom floor in Seattle. Everything. My, my wife loved it. Everything on the floor so that I could move things back and forth between narratives. You know, the, the, always always careful to make sure that everything stayed in chronological order. This is another thing I would pass on to the, the writing folk back there, that chronology, to me, is one of the most powerful tools a writer can deploy. And, and, and it, it, it is, it is ill-advised to depart from chronology unless you know exactly what you're doing. Anyway, having said that, where was I? All over my floor. All over my floor. I remember all. I remember all. Beautiful spring day in Seattle. And doors to the little balcony were open, and our beloved, now late, um, golden retriever Molly, walked in, walked across my narrative. Just, just sort of big steps, walking just blithely out to the balcony. Got her toy. Back across the narrative. <laughs> And it really helped put it in perspective. <laughs> so. Well, how about two or three more questions? Anybody get to get your hands up? So we can bring a mic to you. Hard to see. Yeah, two or three more. Yep. Oh, working our way towards somebody. Another. It's a race. So I was curious. Um, you started off by saying that you. Wait, were wait, wait who's, who's who's talking? Oh, Sorry. okay, okay. <laughs> um, you started off by saying that you were reluctant to write about Holmes because you didn't want to contribute to like what you call crime porn, which right. is very common and has been. Um, I wanted to know how you felt about the resurgence of the crime and serial killers as a form of dramatic entertainment in society rather than education, like the third adaptation of Dahmer's crimes and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 don't, re I don't really understand. Well, I do understand on some level, but I don't really... I, I hear repeatedly from people who talk to me at, at, at book events saying, oh, I love serial killers. I love serial killer stories. I'm just like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. Um, the, 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 the prevalence of serial killer stories is sort of, it, it, it's kind of disturbing. You know, if you go into a, st into a bookstore and you see all these books and invariably there's some, some knife on the cover and blood and so forth. And, you know, and of course I, I buy them all, but, you know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Um, but it, 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 it's vaguely troubling, and I, I find myself especially troubled because 
because I have three daughters, and when you think about things like what these books are proposing in 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 real terms of what all this stuff means, it's really it's really really is disturbing. Although I would say that my <clears throat> my eldest daughter, Kristen, when she was I don't know how young she was, I think she was like twelve. She I mean this cuts to her sort of amazing amazing memory, but she memorized the entire script to Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. <laughs> it, w it was really, really compelling. She, al she also memorized the entire script to Dracula, Dead and Loving It. It's made long car trips very entertaining, let me tell you. <laughs> and my kids, my kids, all three of my daughters, like to imitate Jodie Foster. Uh, in Silence of the Lambs, as Clarice Starling, Lecter. <laughs> anyway. A couple more questions. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing I felt about Devil in White City was, huh, it's going to sound silly, how cheaply that city was built. Uh, somehow that am that amazed me. So you've done a renovation also. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I know what you mean. I know what you well, mean. Well, huh? they say <clears throat> they were able to tear that city down in a few months. And under that part of the, with this, the Devil in the White City that's from the World's Fair, <clears throat> Is uh, was put down, um, and that became the bedrock, more or less, of a big part of Chicago. Well, yeah, the, the World's Fair of 1893. The, the one, one thing that makes it even more amazing <clears throat> is that it was designed from the beginning to to not be permanent. It was meant to be a temporary monument. Burnham was very insistent on that. That that this that this fair would not persist. It was built to exist for a time period. And then ironically, you know, fate played a big hand in that and it burned down. So, so you know, he got, he, he got what he wished. I have to tell you, by the way, um, something that, that uh, back to the, this question of serial killers. Um, when, when I launched that book, <clears throat> I launched it actually in, in New York, <laughs> go figure. Um, and, and after the talk, after the talk, um, two, two young women, two, two, two corporate lawyers, that was the scary part, two, they, they got up and announced that they were members of the Mudgett family. They were, this, you know, Mudgett, the Mudgett line continued on to whatever. You run into Mudgets all over them. This is Mudgett, uh, who uh, for a time was working at a, at a, at a bookstore in Seattle. Um, so, so here they were at this, at this at Talk. They get up. They they announce that they are they are the descendants of of Holmes slash Mudgett, and I was like, oh god, here comes the lawsuit. But then they said they said we're we're actually really delighted with your book because it really you know it really captures our our black sheep relative. And then they said, as a matter of fact, we are having a family reunion this weekend in the Hudson Valley. Would I like to come? And I said, you know, I'm having lunch with, with Charlie Manson at Sing Sing. I got a, <laughs> I can't do it. But no, true story. They invited me to their family reunion, presumably at Terrytown. I mean, where else? You know, Sleepy Hollow. But anyway, sorry, I, I diverged. But another question. Uh -oh. Go for it. You're talking about like computer, right, 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 right. Yeah, well, you, yeah, yeah. You know, I, 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 I again, I, I have sort of a hybrid approach. I write with a computer. Um, uh, 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 
I use actually Apple Pages, not Microsoft Word. Uh, Microsoft Word to me has gotten just so complicated and so full of mysterious things that if you hit the wrong button, you don't know where your file went. Um, but I, 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 I use a computer, but when I have a really challenging passage, I use a pencil, Ticonderoga number two, best pencil ever made, Ticonderoga number two pencil, and a yellow legal pad, um, reinforced for the, the strong backing. And I manually write the toughest scenes because I think that works because you have to think about it. You're not spewing. When you're writing on a computer, you're spewing, you know? And that's the joy of it, and that's the beauty of it. You write a bad paragraph, it's gone, you know? Um, back when I first started writing and I used a typewriter, I loved my typewriter, by the way. I loved the physical process of writing something with a typewriter, the banging around, and you get pissed off and you're banging harder and slamming that roll across the, across the back of the typewriter. Um, and then, of course, comes the time when you've got to white out everything and start over. But, but so I use, I, use, I use those two methods, um, uh, and, and the yellow legal pad and, 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 the, and the pencil really help me get through the most difficult passages. That's interesting. Is there any, any topic that I haven't written about that I wish I could? You know, I, 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 are you actually trying to get at my failed ideas? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you know, I, I, I without saying what it was, I, I once, um, <clears throat> I once went through the entire process of a, a book proposal, which is how you do it in the world of nonfiction, and mine are typically long and detailed. It's like just like 105 pages sent it to my agent, the minute I hit send, I knew I was not gonna do that book. I knew that it was not, it lacked something fundamental. I, it's fun, fundamental and I got on the phone to my agent and I just said, look, forget it, I'm not doing it. He said, okay. <laughs> yeah, I would love to do th some things that I don't feel I can do because I don't think the material exists. I'd like to write about Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe, but <clears throat> there are really only a, a, several, several sort of diary-like accounts, I looked into it actually, diary-like accounts, and they're all sort of kind of flimsy and contradictory and so forth. There are no, no details, no telegrams, you know, nothing like that. Um, I'd love to, so that, that's one of them, you know, Magellan circumnavigation. You know, things, things way, way in the past that are almost impossible to, to do in the way that I, I would like to do them. Well, folks, um, yeah, what a great evening. Thank you all for coming out. Thank everybody. you all for coming, yeah, on this cold <laughs> night. Yeah. Thank, thank you.